Well, good uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, Judge Wynn, to Duke Law School. We wish you were with us in person, and we could Me too. Uh, we could break bread together and really have have some fun, walk you around our beautiful campus. Uh, but uh, this will have to do for now. It's uh, it's such a pleasure to to welcome you. Um, we don't know each other, but we we were just chatting before, and we have there's so many parallels in our own careers. Uh, that we're, uh, I know we would be fast friends <laughs> if we had the opportunity. So Judge, judge Wynn, you're a, you're, you're a judge on the Ninth Circuit, which is uh, my old circuit uh, where I was a judge. And it's an amazing uh, part of the country because it's the entire West, really. It's the nine Western states and it includes Alaska and Hawaii. It's a, it's a great place to be a judge because the judicial conferences are held at the uh, places that you really want to see and go to like Mon <laughs> California and Montana <laughs> and Wyoming and you have uh, you have such a riveting life story really amazing and inspiring you were born in in Vietnam and you came to this country in 1975 when South Vietnam was overrun by uh, North the army of uh, North Vietnam and your father was an officer in the South Vietnamese uh, military and uh, and so you fled to the United States and initially you lived in a, a tent city. I've seen the, the picture of where you lived at Camp Pendleton. It was very, very um, a Spartan existence there in San Diego. But through dint of hard work and obvious a great deal of talent, uh, raw talent, you uh, went to Occidental College and UCLA for law school. And then uh, you went to a a fine firm in Los Angeles for a while. And then you went to the U.S. Attorney's Office where you had a great career uh, in public corruption and in the government fraud sections. And, um, and then in 2002, you began your judicial career. You First, you were appointed to the Superior Court in California, a state court, um, which I'm sure was a, uh, in Los Angeles County. So you, it must have been extremely busy and demanding. And then in 2009, President Obama appointed you to the U.S. District Court, and he didn't wait too long uh, before elevating you. I'm an old district judge, so we don't think of it as an elevation. But anyway, you you went up <laughs> to the Ninth Circuit uh, where you are now, and that happened in, in uh, 2012. You are the first Asian American woman to serve on a United States Court of Appeals, which is fairly remarkable. So thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's really a delight to have you here, an honor, and I know the students would uh, are anxious to hear 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 from you. Uh, why don't we start at the at, at the beginning because it is interesting. Uh, you started your your young life in Vietnam, and then you came to this country. I think you were about ten years old. Uh, can you tell us about that experience in your your family background? Sure, let me start actually, David, for thanking you for giving me an opportunity to be uh, a part of this program. Uh, unfortunately, we have to do it virtually now, but I look forward to a future opportunity to visit with you uh, and the students at Duke Law School in person, hopefully. So it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, I was born in Vietnam in a small uh, town called Dalat, which is, uh, for those of you who don't know, in the Central Highlands region of Vietnam. Uh, my dad was an officer in the Republic uh, of Vietnam's army, and my mom had an accounting job um, in our town's local government. Um, you mentioned the ongoing civil war, which really, from the time I was born until the time I left, um, uh, we were we were a war-torn country. But I still remember uh, my early childhood years in Vietnam as uh, very idyllic, especially compared to my early years uh, in the United States after uh, we arrived here. Um, I grew up in a large family. There were six kids total, very close in age. We were about one, and then the last few kids were two years apart. And we had a huge extended uh, family uh, nearby. My uncle was the mayor of the town, and our support system was incredibly strong. And I was a very good student. I loved law school, so I had a happy school community as well. Uh, all that changed in 1975 when South Vietnam lost the war. Uh, and of course, um, given my dad's military ties, uh, he was in mortal danger. So we were really 
among the tens of thousands and thousands of um, Vietnamese desperately looking for an escape route as the communist forces were marching south and taking city by city. Um, it was a pretty harrowing journey, and that's a whole separate conversation, <laughs> which I won't go into details, but suffice it to say, we were just incredibly fortunate. And through a series of really serendipitous uh, events, we happened to be among uh, those who were airlifted out of Vietnam as part of the US evacuation effort, um, leaving really with the assistance of an American civilian who, were, uh, who was a friend of my parents. Uh, we eventually ended up at the Marine base in um, San Diego, and, and that's how my family ended up settling in Southern California. Because of the circumstances of our departure, uh, we really left with nothing but the clothes on our backs and, and the displacement, along with our you know, dire economic circumstances the first few years. Uh, those were overwhelming stressors on the family. And so the first few years were, were pretty rough. But what's really common among refugee groups, and it was certainly true for us, uh, is really the recognition and appreciation every day that we were actually among the luckiest ones just by being here in the United States. So that has always served as a tremendous motivation for my parents and for me as well. You know, the, that's, that's interesting what you say, because you might have felt that you were a, a victim in some way, and, and that can, that can that can have a different kind of psychological impact, but you you had a sense of feeling grateful that you were among the lucky ones, and I suppose that was motivating for you. Um, yeah, grateful, definitely, but also um, just a tremendous sense of optimism because now you know we're free and we have opportunities that that others you know ha have died for really. But you did have to start all over again. And why don't you talk about that a little bit? I know you worked in your, your parents' uh, donut shop and uh, your first generation, obviously. And you know, sort of the impact that's had on, on who you became. And, and, and if you even can connect it to your judicial philosophy, that would, that would be interesting as well, if it does connect. Yeah, the first few years, uh, both of my parents just took on whatever jobs they could find. And... Um, you know, each of them worked two jobs, sometimes even three jobs at a time, but they were very entrepreneurial in spirit. Uh, my dad found an opportunity to train to be a manager of um, Winchell's donut shop, uh, just so that he could gain the experience and learn how to run a business uh, from the inside. And eventually they opened up their own donut shop. And he really chose um, that profession because it's something that you can start with very little, relatively little capital. Uh, but in order to run it at a modest profit, you really had to rely on family labor, as so many small uh, businesses are. So he relied on my siblings um, and me to work the shop every day after school and on weekends as well. And, and I'm glad you raised that because I think those experiences were really formative in, in shaping who I am today. I always say that my parents are my biggest heroes and my biggest role models because no matter how hard I work or how much I've managed to achieve in my own career, I don't. I really don't think it can ever compare to what they successfully overcame. You know, the language barrier, starting over again uh, with six young kids in tow in their 30s, and to achieve what they have achieved and have educated all of their children. Uh, I don't think anything that I've managed to achieve really um, compares favorably to that. Um, but, but, you know, I also want to make the point that I don't think my family's experience is unique. Uh, it's actually a pretty common uh, journey narrative uh, by a lot of first generation uh, families. Oh, that's amazing. So you went to Occidental, I think you majored in English, and then you decided to go to law school. What, what drew you to law school? And, um, you know, uh, uh, coming to this country at age 10, uh, you might have, and having to learn a whole new language, maybe law school would seem awfully imposing, uh, although you, you'd had a number of years there, obviously, to, to catch up. But I'm wondering whether that English major uh, really helped you, um, when you when you got to law school. Uh, yes, actually, I think it's one of the, the better um, majors for law school because uh, you do a lot of reading. And of course, you do a lot of writing as well and, and you know, key ingredients to success as a law student. Um, it's funny because I did 
didn't know any English when I arrived at the age of 10. And we had um, a month, six weeks or so to learn English before the school year started again in the fall. And my first um, uh, foray into English language was actually with a toy that we were given. And it's one of those pull toys where you pull the string and it would say A, apple, A, P, P, L, E, B, boy, B, O, Y. And that's how, that, that was basically my first English um, lessons was learning the alphabet and, and spelling out um, the words. Uh, so my dad was quite surprised when I chose to major in English. Uh, like all, uh, like so many good Asian students, I was supposed to be pre-med. And short of that, if you couldn't be pre-med and, and, and succeed in becoming a doctor, then at least go into engineering or something. But I was terrible in the math and sciences. And I've always loved to read. And, you know, from the age of 10, 11 on, I was always uh, had my nose buried in a book. So um, my dad said, well, with that major, you're just destined for unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking really hard about what to do. I had some thoughts about becoming a teacher, uh, but I hedged my bets and I took the LSAT and the GRE at the same time and ended up doing much better in the LSAT and uh, secured a pretty nice scholarship to UCLA. And so I ended up going to law school. Uh, but you know, to be frank, I entered law school with no real understanding of what a lawyer's job would really entail or the opportunities that the profession uh, would have to offer. Uh, but it seemed like a pretty good fit. And so that's how I ended up in law school. Yeah, I don't think that distinguishes you from probably a lot of the other uh, students who are on <laughs> this sure. uh, on this program. And certainly I, I, who came from a family of lawyers, I, I really did, I only had the vaguest idea of what actually, what a lawyer, what a lawyer did. So uh, you were drawn to the law, you went to law school, and then you went into private practice. And then pretty quickly, after a few years, you decided to become a, uh, a prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, can you talk about some of those uh, career decisions that you made and why? Sure. Uh, coming out of law school, I had a little bit of um, loans and uh, law school debt. I'm sure so many students can relate to that. And so I went to a firm, uh, but I already knew that being a federal prosecutor was really my dream job. When I was in law school, um, during my first summer, I externed down at the district court and just saw you know, AUSAs as well as federal public defenders at work. And it just seemed really interesting and challenging. I had the opportunity to meet with an AUSA, to talk to them about their job in depth. And, and very early on, that was my focus, but um, the office didn't hire directly out of school. So I thought going to private practice in a firm that allowed me to take on as much responsibility uh, as I can as a young lawyer would better prepare me uh, for a job in the U.S. Attorney's Office. That was kind of my target from day one. And I, would, I was lucky to be hired when um, DOJ lifted the hiring freeze. And the hiring freeze was in place for a couple of years. And so the timing was just about right. I was three and a half, uh, three and a half or so years out of law school at that point uh, when I joined the office. So when you when you join a, a large office like that, is there a unit that you tend to go into as you as you begin? Right. The the unit that you go into, um, I don't know what it's called now. I think it's still called the general crimes unit. We call it rookie row because it's where you essentially um, try small cases and uh, you know take it from post indictment all the way through trial and sentencing, uh, as well as handle appeals as well. And so, you know, after a few trials under your belt, uh, then you move on to one of the senior sections. And I've done different sections. You know, I started out uh, in a senior section, the public corruption government fraud section. And then I joined um, the organized, it was then called the organized crime strike force, but essentially violent crimes. I wanted to diversify my experiences a little bit and, and, and uh, you know, try some more cases. And learn how to run, um, you know, Title III wiretap investigations. And so moving away from a fraud-based unit um, gave me the opportunity to expand my experiences. How, how did you enjoy uh, trying cases? I actually loved trying cases, and that's what attracted me to the job in the first place. You know, I, I coming out of law school, I wanted um, to have a public interest, uh, public service job. Uh, I wanted to be in the trial trenches and yet I also love legal research and writing. So being in AUSA allowed me to hone my trial skills, but also allowed me 
to um, uh, to do legal research and writing. And as uh, your students may know, even on the criminal side, federal court is heavier on the papers as compared to state court. So uh, as an AUSA, I handled all of my own appeals um, in the Ninth Circuit, the same court on which I'm now serving as a circuit judge. Yeah, that's sort of fun. You have to face the music. If you made a mistake and you take the case on appeal, you're the prosecutor. You've got to, yes. You've got to own it and defend it. <laughs> Explain why you made the decisions that you did. Yeah. I think many of the offices now have appellate units, so the, the assistants don't have to uh, own it and defend it quite so much, but um, but it is a good experience. Uh, uh, and it, it's so wonderful to be in the trial court before a, a single judge and then before a jury and then from time to time you get to go to the the circuit and you argue you're you're arguing before a panel of three and it's just a different it's a different kind of experience but they're both very for a lawyer it's um it's very challenging advocacy and ultimately very very gratifying i think when when you have a sense that you did it well which you don't always have but yeah, and, and, and frankly, it, it's it's complementary. Where I think one skill set, or one set of experiences, really enhance the other. Because when you have to stand up there before a panel of circuit judges and defend a call that you made as a trial attorney, you then become a better trial attorney because you understand um, what the record reflects and how those issues then end up translating at the court of appeals level. You you get a degree of comfort. I I, I remember that I. Um... When I, when I joined the U.S. Attorney's Office, I think I, I hadn't heard yet from the bar. I, had, I hadn't passed the bar yet. I'd taken the bar, but I hadn't heard, heard back that I'd passed. And so they assigned me uh, a bunch of appeals to write. You know, I'd been a law clerk, and so I'd, and I wrote like 10. And then I had very quickly, after I heard from the bar, I had something like seven arguments in the, in the Ninth Circuit. And the yeah. first couple, and the first couple, I was extremely nervous. But before I had like the third, I had I had a jury trial, and I noticed that when I got back to the court of appeals, I wasn't nervous at all. <laughs> I was a little worried. I was a little worried. I was too relaxed. But uh, it's a, it's so great. I think for students who haven't done much public speaking or debating, or the the idea of, of trying a case or having an oral argument is it's intimidating. But the more you do it, um, the more you enjoy it. At least that's what I found. Uh, did you go through, you had the Department of Justice training uh, when you were a, a new assistant, you went to the, um, whatever we call it, the, the, the advocacy school? Yes, uh, actually I didn't go for, I think six or seven months um, into my stint as a, um, an AUSA. Uh, the office is quite large. I was part of the Central District of California, and, and so it's a big office, and there's a lot of um, internal training as well. And so uh, that, at that time, they waited until there was a sufficiently large group of AUSAs so they could send back East together. Uh, right. and, and I thought that was actually in some ways very helpful, because by then I would had you know a number of months of experience under my belt, and so it wasn't just dry lectures. I could sort of envision how... Uh, the lessons uh, would be uh, translated into real practice. I think it's hard to convey how exciting and how much fun it is in a way to uh, try your your first few cases and you you really you, <laughs> you're worried about the rules of evidence which you don't know all that well and you're um, you don't really know how to ask a question. It, it's not second nature. It becomes second nature. How to cross-examine and how to do a really good direct, but those first few trials, you really labor over everything. You know, what's my next question and how to ask it. And um, I'm wondering whether you know you have a sort of fond recollection of that period in your life. Oh, I do. I do. Those are some of my favorite memories: is being in the trial trenches and learning how to be a good trial lawyer, uh, learning how to connect with the jury. Uh, and, and the opportunity to work with just incredibly talented um, individuals alongside you. There's nothing that bonds people more than being in the trial trenches and going through the stresses of trial together. Uh, and so, you know, I made a lot of good friends uh, in the U.S. Attorney's Office and, and who are still good friends today. Uh, yeah, so that, that was to be a young lawyer 
with that sort of exciting practice and opportunities is pretty tremendous. Well, it would be great, I think, if uh, if you wouldn't mind to sort of comparing what it would be like to be a young prosecutor versus a young uh, public defender, federal public defender, because many of our students are are thinking about that. And I, I think most of them probably think that they would want to be a defense attorney. At least that's what I, I get the sense of that rather than a prosecutor. Um, although I might be wrong about that, but wh what do you, how, how do you see that? That's a choice. Yeah, and actually I had thought at one point um, that I may want to be a federal public defender instead of uh, being on the prosecution side. Uh, frankly, to this day, when I talk to young people about the opportunities presented, I tell them it's actually much tougher in some ways to be a federal public defender than to be in AUSA. Uh, all the resources uh, are on the government's uh, side. And, you know, the, once uh, a defendant is indicted, uh, the evidence is pretty compelling. And so it kind of narrowed the um, strategic options that the defense would really have. Um, part of the reason why I uh, went actually in favor of being a prosecutor instead of a defense attorney is really the opportunity to work up a case pre-charging. So the opportunity to learn how to conduct uh, grand jury investigations, the opportunity to work with uh, federal agencies in putting together a case, the opportunity to, as I mentioned earlier, learn how to um, do a wiretap investigation. Uh, those opportunities really aren't available on the defense side. There are different opportunities and a different set of challenges, but, but I really wanted to have that experience under my belt and in kind of evaluating the two offices um, in the central district, I thought that uh, going on the federal prosecution side was a better fit for me personally. But, um, you know, my graduating class had um, tons of uh, students who wanted to go into public service and many of them ended up working on the defense side. And I know they enjoyed it very much. And it's, it's very, very challenging uh, yeah. to have to deal with some of those issues that the defense have to deal with. I think that, you know, working with the, with the law enforcement agents and uh, with the grand jury, that, that, that part of the investigation um, process, which can be extremely lengthy and is a big part of the job that if you're a certain kind of person, that's really fun and try, trying to pull a case together and see whether it, you, you can actually make the case. Um, you have a pretty good feeling that a crime was committed and uh, the question is whether you can get that, the, uh, pull the evidence together in, in a way where you'll, you have a, you're confident. Um, it's also a sort of a charge to stand up when you're 30 years old or 28 years old and say that you represent the United States. I think at least I think probably for both of us, that was every time you said that, it, you had this sort of sense of awe. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's definitely true for me. In fact, when I became a little bit more um, seasoned and the opportunity came to uh, maybe consider being a supervisor, uh, the supervisory position um, of Rookie Row was really the only one I was interested in. Because when you're a supervisor, you take a reduced caseload. So to give up the opportunity to do your own cases, uh, what it what made it worthwhile for me uh, is the job of training new AUSAs because they really uh, don't come into the office with any prior criminal law experience. And, you know, to be, as you say, a young lawyer, to have the level of discretion that AUSAs have and making decisions that really in, impact people's um, liberty uh, interest, uh, I, I think it's important to get the right supervision uh, and to appreciate the uh, not only the privilege, but the responsibilities that come with that job. Let, let's talk about uh, criminal sentencing a little bit, because you, you know a great deal about it, both as a prosecutor and as a judge. And um, You and I both experienced this, this period in time when, when Congress uh, put in the, the sentencing guidelines and then coupled the sentencing guidelines with, the, with mandatory minimum statutes. Um, that provided for mandatory minimum penalties. And there was an interplay between the guidelines and these mandatory minimums because they set the guidelines up at a level where they would um, be, be sufficiently severe uh, with these mandatory minimums. And uh, I 
coming uh, somewhat before you, I practiced under the pre-guideline system and the post-guideline system, and the sentences just shot through the roof. Um, mostly this was because of the mandatory minimums. And we now look back at this period, and you know, some people, critics, uh, particularly from the academic community, say, well, it was a policy of mass incarceration, and there's, um, there's some some point to that criticism. I'm, I'm wondering wh how you evaluate this. Uh, how do, do, you, do you think we've gone too far with some of these crim criminal penalties, uh, maybe particularly in the drug area where they are quantity-based and uh, they can be extremely high? Yeah, by the time I became a federal prosecutor, uh, the guidelines were already in place and they were mandatory. And so judges had very limited discretion uh, in terms of uh, applying the guidelines. By the time I returned to federal court as a judge, that was in the post-Booker era, and so the guidelines became advisory. And uh, uh, as I'm sure you'll agree with me, David, sentencing is one of the hardest and most important aspects of being a trial judge. So coming back to federal court in the advisory guideline land, I really appreciated the greater latitude that, that I was given in determining the appropriate sentence on a case-by-case -case basis, defendant by defendant. As for mandatory minimum uh, sentences, the problem uh, is that many low-level offenders were swept up by these draconian sentences as well that really was meant for uh, bigger players in, let's say, a, a drug conspiracy case. And uh, the judge's discretion, in, in my view, was too limited, even if there are mitigating factors that warrant a lower sentence. And so I, I share much of the expressed concern about mass, mass incarceration and you know, whether minority communities are being disproportionately affected uh, by these uh, sentences and uh, by the mandatory minimums. Uh, of course, uh, you know that there's a safety valve uh, option where certain non-violent uh, low-level offenders are eligible for reduction of their sentences. Uh, and then they have to meet a set of criteria uh, but yet, even with the availability of the safety valve, um, the federal inmate population incarcerated for drug crimes has steadily increased in the past decade plus or so. So I think it's important to think about and, and really figure out why that's so. And in the First Step Act, um, as some of your um, listeners may know, among numerous other reforms, really expanded the uh, availability of the safety valve, and, and I do think that's a step in the right direction. You know, we used to have a parole commission in the federal courts, and uh, well, they weren't in the federal courts, they were in the federal uh, prison system. And so the judge would sentence, this was pre-guideline, the judge would sentence, and uh, the sentence might be, let's say, 30 years for a, a string of bank robberies. But the person wouldn't wasn't going to do 30 years, there were parole guidelines, and they might be Oh, you know, five to seven years, something like that. And then there was a parole commission that would um, evaluate how the person was doing in in, in prison. And the, the the ultimate philosophy was uh, there was a sense that people could be rehabilitated and it was possible uh, to to do that. And at some point, as a country, we lost faith, I think, in, in rehabilitation and just thought in terms of, of uh, deterrence and, and incarceration. And uh, that's, that's the story, maybe, of the last 20 or, or 30 years. But with, I'm just wondering, with crime rates much lower than they were in the 90s, maybe we have an opportunity to, to look back at that older system and maybe take the best parts of it, see if we can't do better. There's always room for, for reform. As you know, the sentencing guidelines were enacted in part to um, kind of reduce the disparity uh, across courtrooms, for example, where the same defendants are similarly situated, but yet uh, the outcomes are very different depending what, what judge you happen to be in front of. And so I think that there are uh, good policy arguments for bringing um, some uniformity, of course, recognizing that there are individual differences, but but harmonizing uh, some of those um, differences in, in the sentences imposed. But of course, there are many, many countervailing arguments as well. And so I think you bring up some excellent points that we need to constantly revisit and think about. So you were, you were doing great in the US Attorney's Office. You'd become a supervisor. You really obviously really enjoyed the work. And then uh, something happened and you, you ended up becoming 
the first Vietnamese American woman appointed to the Los Angeles Superior Court by then Governor Gray Davis of California. So how did that all happen? I, as you said, loved being an AUSA and I thought I was going to be a lifer in that office. I never thought that I would want to do something different uh, and really had not thought about a, a career on the bench. Um, but you know, I think I'm incredibly fortunate throughout my career. I've been blessed with a lot of fantastic mentors. Um, I've always been very engaged in the um, legal community and I've always done a ton of bar activities. And so through that, I, I met a lot of different people and, and, and a lot of them came to me and planted the seed um, to be a judge. And, you know, they would say things like, you have the right temperament for it, you have the right set of skills, you have the right uh, demeanor, why don't you think about it? Come sit with me. Let's explore this option. And so I think that's what kind of opened the door to a judicial career. Uh, and when I had gained a sufficient number of years of experience to, to be qualified to put in an application for Superior Court, I was really encouraged to apply. And, you know, I had lots of people who mapped out the process for me and you know, was, were willing to generously have breakfast and, and made a few phone calls on my behalf. And, and, you know, part of my concern was, well, I really was a federal court practitioner. I had a, the first few years in um, private practice was primarily in state court. But other than that, all of my time in uh, trial courts really spent in federal court. So how, how was I going to make that transition into state court? And it's not an uncommon path for um, AUSAs to actually take the state court bench. And so I had a lot of people to consult with and uh, to ease my concerns and to satisfy myself that I could do a good job if I were to go for that um, opportunity. And so it ended up working out quite well uh, because I loved my time on the state court bench. What, what was your first assignment uh, on, the, on the state court? I spent two months, maybe three months now, I can't recall exactly, um, doing trials and uh, motions. And so it wasn't a direct set calendar. But very quickly, I was transferred um, into a very busy courtroom where uh, I handled everything from arraignment all the way through uh, sentencing. And of course, I kept all of the defendants uh, before me uh, for probation and handled probation violations as well. So it was a very um, overwhelming, in some respects, calendar to step into as a brand new judge. But I think I was given that assignment in part because I had such a depth of experience already handling criminal matters. Uh, and so I was maybe doing two or three felony preliminary hearings in the morning, uh, a direct set misdemeanor uh, calendar, all criminal cases primarily in the afternoon, and then squeezing a trial or two in between, uh, all in the course of the same uh, week. And then I did that for a few years, and, and then I became the, what we call site judge or supervising judge of my courthouse, and, um, and then took on a direct set felony calendar at that point. And, you know, I also volunteered to do a, a number of civil matters. Uh, my courthouse handled primarily criminal cases, and there, there were judges there who said, oh, it's a civil case is coming along, or a settlement conference for this other judge, if you want to do it. And so I would volunteer for those opportunities just to diversify my experience a little bit. That's really great. Uh, you know, students often ask me and they probably ask you, you know, how do you become a judge? How, how does that work? Uh, and what, it, what, what advice do you give when you're asked that? Well, I, I think the system differs depending on the state. So now focusing on the opportunity to be a state court judge, um, it's uh, both in California, both by election. So if there's an open superior court seat, you could run for that. And there are uh, judicial consultants that you can hire to help you through that process. Most of the seats um, on this LA Superior Court and actually in the state of California are uh, filled by gubernatorial appointment. And so if there's an application process, you pull up the application now online, and then um, you fill it out. Um, you try to figure out before you even apply what the process is, like understand who the decision makers are, understand the dynamics of the appointment process, understand what evaluation processes are put in place. Uh, when I went through, it was both by a Jenny Commission, which does the independent evaluation. They reach out to all of your opposing counsel, for example, your colleagues, the judges before 
uh, whom you've practiced and get feedback from that. And then you go through a similar process with the local bar association, but it differs depending on the state. And so I think step one is to figure out who's making the decision and what the process entails. And then uh, number two, if you are going for a trial court position to look for opportunities to gain some trial experience. It's one, it's one of those uh, areas of life that is still very dependent on your reputation, which is, you know, a kind of a, a, a funny concept in this sort of modern gigantic world that we inhabit. But it, there's still such a thing as reputation. People know you and they have an opinion of you. And it, ver it seems to affect your likelihood of success um, very much. So, I mean, one thing to keep in mind, I think, for people starting out in life is not to be a jerk with opposing counsel, because um, aside from the fact that it's usually not very helpful to pursuing the case in the right way, it also can come back to haunt you when later you might want to be a judge. And then people say this is a very difficult person with a bad temperament and would not be a good judge. Yeah, no, absolutely, David. That's a that's a very important point. If you're in litigation, it's an adversarial process, but you really uh, can practice. And frankly, it's much more enjoyable if you are the type of lawyer who really respects everybody and that you maintain your integrity at all times. I uh, mentor a lot of people who are interested in becoming judges, and I look at a lot of different applications. And I think among the most important reviewers are opposing counsel's comments. What did they think of you in the way that you treated them? Uh, did, you, did you maintain your integrity in the discovery process or did you try to hide the ball? Um, what was your pleading like? You know, did you, uh, were you overly aggressive? You can be very assertive and vigorously represent your client's interests without being a jerk about it. So why don't the two of us spend a little time comparing state and federal court because, uh, I think that might be interesting for students to hear, and you're uniquely well suited to do that. I mean, for one thing, Los Angeles County has just about as many state court judges as the entire federal system has judges. It's, uh, it's maybe, there might be maybe a hundred more in the federal system, but uh, that, that's by way of saying that the state courts essentially handle most of the legal work of this country, and that's where most judges um, are located. Um, what what other you you've done both so you know both more than I what what other differences uh, would you point to? Well, I think one of the biggest difference transitioning from being a lawyer to being a judge um, is how isolating being a judge really is. Yeah. Uh, and and so when I left the U.S. Attorney's Office and and became a state court judge, I was relatively young. I I was the youngest um, lawyer appointed to the Los Angeles uh, bench at that point. Um, I found it to be incredibly isolating, but being a federal judge is on a whole nother level. So instead of, you know, spending every morning having chambers discussions with counsel for both sides, most of my time as a federal judge in chambers is really interacting with the tiny staff I had in chambers. So I felt that difference immediately when I transitioned from being a state court to a federal judge. Um, another significant uh, difference uh, and part of the reason I was really attracted to the opportunity to return to federal court it is the opportunity on the federal side to handle a, a large civil docket that had a good variety in Los Angeles of complex cases. The Los Angeles Superior Court bench is so large that most judges handle either exclusively criminal or civil calendars, or if you're handling a probate calendar or a juvenile calendar or a dependency calendar. So, you're, you're, you're relatively siloed. There are a few opportunities for crossover, but you know you handle um, really either criminal or civil, generally speaking. But as a federal judge, you really do both at the same time. And that presents, I think, a whole different set of challenges. And so I, I was eager for, for that um, intellectual stimulation that comes with a complex federal uh, docket. And so of course, you know, being a a federal baby, so to speak, it was a very comfortable transition for me to come back to federal court. You know, I, I don't know how it is in Los Angeles County, I, I, but I do know in Sacramento County, um, where I was, that the diff one of the key differences is that in federal court, 
as cases come in, they are randomly assigned the day they, they that they come into the clerk's office. They're randomly assigned to a judge, and so they they put your initials on it, and you get they have a computer program that just randomly assigns them. So that let's say a civil case comes in, uh, and and there's a wheel, and let's say it's assigned to me, I get it from day one. Whereas in and and so I'm uh, as the judge, I'm managing the case from the very beginning. I, ha I handle the discovery disputes, and then uh, those sa same discovery disputes may involve issues that are actually very uh, germane to what is being tried. And people will say, "Well, you know, Your Honor, they shouldn't be permitted to go into this area because you restricted discovery on this." And you said, "That's right. That's not fair." Um, whereas in state court, it's a presiding judge system. Uh, it, at least in Sacramento. And so, so what happens is like a judge that d doesn't typically get the case from the beginning, they, they'll, they let's say they end, they try a case and then they're, they're done at, at three in the afternoon. They're supposed to call the presiding judge's chambers and say, I'm free now and I can take something else. And then they get another assignment, maybe another trial or maybe a case that has a discovery dispute or something like that. I'm sure it's more complicated than that, actually, but um, I do remember one of my <laughs> colleagues saying that in state court, you always, when you left at, uh, at the end of the day, you kind of look around to see whose car was also <laughs> in the parking lot where you never worried in federal court because everybody got the same number of cases assigned. <laughs> uh, so I'm, yeah. I'm wondering if it was that true in Los Angeles or was that different? Los Angeles has both, as you mentioned, it's such a giant court system. Uh, that you know, in 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 certain uh, courthouses, uh, there's that system of having trials assigned to you because it creates greater flexibility for whoever's managing the trial calendar to say, okay, well, this trial is ready, courtroom so and so is open, I'm going to send the trial there. But for almost all of my time uh, on the LA Superior Court bench, I had a direct set calendar where I managed the cases from beginning to end and. And I think there's a lot of advantages in doing that because you see the progression of the case and you have that kind of level, level control. So by the time it gets to trial, you're already a little bit familiar uh, with the case. And then of course, you know, we're, we were each assigned calendar deputies. So I had the same players. And given the tremendous uh, volume of cases and the fact that I handled the cases from beginning to end, uh, by necessity, uh, oftentimes it was a very collaborative process where the um, calendar deputies on both sides and I would work together to efficiently resolve the cases that really should be resolved short of trial. So calendar management is very key when you're handling a large direct set calendar like what I had. So then, uh, so you did, you were in the state court and uh, did you move around uh, from a, to different areas of assignment? For example, were you in the juvenile court or in family court or did you have any of those experiences? No, no, not too much. I was pretty much assigned to a criminal law courtroom almost the right. entire time there. Yeah, so then uh, you got word somehow or other that President Obama uh, and the, probably the state senators were taking a look at you and were interested in uh, nominating you. Um, can you talk about that a bit, your, that whole process? Sure. Um, uh, I uh, had been uh, talking to uh, various people about, actually, I was re recruiting for a number of years um, candidates, especially minority candidates that I thought would be good for the federal bench. And so I already knew a couple of people who were involved in that process uh, for um, Senator uh, Dianne Feinstein. And so when President Obama was um, elected, this is his first term, uh, some of those members reached out to me and say, you've got to put your name in, you know, why don't you come back to federal court? And, and I definitely had an interest. I thought the timing would have been different. I would have liked to have stayed on the state court bench a few years longer. But, you know, as is the case with these opportunities, I think it's a good lesson for the students as well. Sometimes opportunities open up, you may feel the timing isn't quite perfect or, or that you're not quite ready. But if you hesitate and you don't step forward, then, then those opportunities may not be around in your, within your ideal timing window, for example. And so, uh, so I had the opportunity and I put in an application and, and was fairly uh, quickly appointed. Uh, I think by that time I'd had uh, seven plus years of experience as a 
a trial court judge in the state court. I had you know, a number of years in federal court uh, as a lawyer and a few years in private pra practice as well. So I think I have the right um, combination of experiences to, to really make myself a credible candidate for the federal uh, trial court bench. And did it did it feel really good, like coming home <laughs> to the federal court? You kind of it, it was a sense of homecoming. You know, it's it's yeah. a bit surreal to kind of walk the hallways as a, a a lawyer, including a very baby trial lawyer, and then coming back some years later and and sit on the bench and have colleagues before whom you practice. Some of whom were very intimidating when you're a young lawyer, and then you're coming back and we're colleagues now. Yeah, you get to call. You have to call them by their first names. That's always a sort of a <laughs> troubling when you are so used to calling somebody Judge So and So because you appeared in front of them. Right. I right. That, yes, I, I definitely have that a very hard time transitioning to the first name uh, with a couple of judges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they so would constantly that... have to correct me and say, "Call me So and So." <laughs> So you you were a district judge, and I I'm sure you love that. Uh, and then you get another lightning strike, and and President Obama wants to put you on the on the Ninth Circuit, <laughs> and you said yes. The opportunity you, was too exciting to pass up. Yeah. So how would you compare being on a trial court versus being on on a court of appeals as yeah. a judge? Um, you know, in some ways, it was a very comfortable transition because um, at a very fundamental level, the job of judging is really the same. You basically look at a set of facts and you research the law and, you know, you have precedent to follow and you have core constitutional principles to apply and, and you try to figure out what the right answer is. But, you know, on a day to day basis, it, it in many ways, it feels very different because as a circuit judge, now I'm sitting on a panel with two other judges. And you've got to do your best to persuade at least one person to your point of view, and hopefully both of them in order to achieve unanimity, which I think is, is important for the development of the law. And that's an aspect that I had never really dealt with before. Uh, by the time I came to the circuit, I'd had uh, 10 years as a trial judge, and you're just used to, you know, being the sole decider, running your own courtroom, right or wrong, you're making the calls and you move on, you don't have to wait on anybody. Uh, and you don't have to try to persuade anybody and you don't, your decisions are the, the right ones you think for that case, but it's not precedential. Other people can uh, see the same set of facts and come out differently. And, and so those are fairly significant differences between being a trial judge and, and now being a court of appeals uh, judge. Uh, in, in writing precedential decisions, I spend a lot of time and all the judges do spend a lot of time about thinking uh, about what the, the rules that we're crafting uh, really mean for the case at hand, but also for other cases that may have slightly different factual variations. Do they come out the same way? Because this, we've pronounced the rule as being this. And how do you write it uh, in a way that really doesn't have um, unintended consequences or implications? And so that's a different challenge to the job that I have that, that, I, that I didn't have before as a trial judge to spend a lot more time and you know the opinions go through many 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 um, different uh, revisions before they're finalized and for the uh, trial court especially because I ran a very busy courtroom you know you you rule the ruling in a timely fashion is very very important it's important to explain your ruling and and to you know explain to the parties why they uh, prevailed or lost in a particular case and to create some sort of record that they could take up before the court of appeals. But, uh, but when you're ready to rule, you move on and you have to because <laughs> you get so far behind that you fall into the, you know, justice delayed is justice denied scenario. Uh, but as a circuit uh, job, it's, it's a little bit different. So uh, we have some questions uh, uh, that I, I want to make sure we get to, uh, even though I have some more questions for you as well. But, but uh, I defer to the students. So we have uh, we have a question about splitting up the Ninth Circuit, which is a, a perennial topic. Uh, was certainly a big topic when I was when I was a judge, and maybe it's going to become a topic again if we see an expansion in the a significant expansion in the number of judges. Um, it's already a big circuit. Do, do you have any? 
views on this, whether it would be a good idea, not a good idea uh, to split the ninth into presumably into two circuits. Yeah, the topic comes up from time to time. And, and so, you know, I think that there are uh, a number of different proposals on the table about how to split up the circuit. I have not seen a satisfactory proposal. Uh, you know, I think conceptually there, there's nothing wrong with creating new circuits, splitting circuits, and it's been done before. Uh, but the problem with the ninth is that, you know, if you if you're going to come up with that and 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 have it be done in a totally you know non political non partisan way, um, you're going to have to put a proposal on the table that makes sense. And I just haven't seen one yet. Uh, from what sort of combinations to the reasons why the circuit should be split. So I expect that it will probably be discussed again at some point. Um, you know, Congress has always, uh, from time to time, suggested that and have held a number of hearings on that. And, and, and the views really differ. Even within uh, my circuit, uh, several judges uh, think that it might be uh, a good idea. Uh, I personally don't think so, and because I have not seen a, a way to do it. I, I remember spending some time on this years ago. There, Justice White, when he was alive, had a commission. Uh, he headed up the commission, uh, and the, the several Ninth Circuit judges, including Pam Reimer, served on it, and they held hearings all around the circuit. And judges uh, wrote in uh, suggesting uh, whether the circuit should be split or how it should be split. The trouble is that the if you do it statistically uh, so that you have two roughly equal circuits in size once you split it, you have to split California uh, into north and south. And nobody wants to do that because, uh, you know, for a period of time, you could actually have inconsistent law within the same state. Um, and that would be peculiar, though there might be ways to deal with that. But that 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 is sort of the nub of the problem, I think. Uh, California just dominates in terms of numbers, uh, the Ninth Circuit. Yeah, quite quite a fair large percentage of cases do come out of California. And, you know, as you know, we deal with a lot of issues, um, trying to do our best to, to figure out what the California courts would say about the development of their law. So as you point out, it doesn't make sense to split the North and the South uh, into two different circuits because then you, you risk essentially creating different bodies of law for the same state. That's just one of the many, many problems among the proposals that are being floated. So a student has asked a question about uh, being a minority judge and whether you could uh, you know, talk about uh, your racial identity and what that, how that affects you as a judge, or if it does affect you, your relationships with colleagues, your experiences in general um, in California in your career. Uh, as a Asian American. Yeah, uh, I, I do think that diversity is important um, in the bench. The judiciary is a public institution and in order to maintain the credibility of the institution, I'm not talking about like whether the decisions are different from, from judge to judge, but, uh, but I think in order to maintain the public trust and credibility, the bench has to do a better job of reflecting uh, the communities that we're really serving. So I think that's important. I think diversity of viewpoints is also important. And you know, when, when you talk about diversity, I'm not just talking about race and gender, but I'm also talking about backgrounds, um, you know, economic circumstances and, and, and really personal life experiences as well, because we're all shaped by our experiences. I'm shaped by the fact that, you know, I learned English as a second language and uh, that you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of economic advantages and how that basically shaped my views and, and my life experiences. And you bring all that to bear, including uh, the fact that I'm a woman and an Asian American woman uh, at that. And, and so you bring all that to the table with you when you try to figure out uh, what the law really means. And, and uh, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that in the vast majority of cases, the judges are quite unanimous in how things should come out because you're, you take an oath to uh, basically apply precedent and, and apply the law in a way that's fair and just without regard to um, ethnicity or gender. And I think all the judges do our best to do that. 
But there are many cases where there's room for difference of opinion. And, and when those cases come along, I think it's very helpful to have different perspectives in the room uh, in discussing those cases. And so, uh, so does it make a difference to be a woman? Uh, yes, not in every case, but certainly in some cases, you're going to be able to explain something to your male colleagues uh, in a way that maybe they weren't um, totally uh, sensitive to before. I think uh, one of my favorite um, examples uh, actually is from uh, Justice Ginsburg, where she was talking about uh, strip search of a, uh, if I recall correctly, a middle school uh, student and uh, in a room uh, of male colleagues, she was explaining how uh, a young woman going through puberty, how sensitive that would be. And so it just basically gives her colleagues a different appreciation into a scenario that she could better relate to as a woman. And, and, so, uh, and so it does make a difference, I think, to have um, the differences of perspective on the bench. And I hope uh, uh, that I'm able to bring something unique uh, to the table when we're talking about cases where there's room for discussion and disagreement. So we have two more questions and we only have about a minute left, maybe a minute and a half. Oh, goodness, the hour has flown by. <laughs> it really has. So one question is um, whether there are challenges that your law clerks uh, ha face or difficulties that they have, when, particularly when they're first starting as your law clerk, uh, that you need to help them with. In, in other words, is there something that, that they typically find uh, very difficult to do well for you? Uh, as they're beginning? Yeah, it depends. It depends on the law clerk and depends on the case. Um, many of my law clerks do come directly out of law school, but many come from uh, either private practice firms or a district court clerkship or both. And I'm extremely lucky. Um, all the federal judges are. We're able to kind of draw a pool of just supremely talented and smart law clerks. I think one thing that's difficult to transition in terms of being a young person making a recommendation is to really um, not just be rule focused, you have to figure out what the rules are, but also to understand how it impacts litigants in a real world way. Um, some of them are young and don't have a whole lot of life experiences yet. And so, um, and so sometimes their views are very academic, um, more so than practical. And so I think if it's one thing that I try to uh, shape and guide them, it's really uh, in looking at the law uh, in, in practical terms, as well as in very uh, academic terms. Well, we have one more question. It's from a, a judge uh, from Brazil in a busy court uh, who's also getting a master's degree and who's uh, been attending today, and I think we'll have to hold that. He asks how the academy and the bench can help one another. And it's a very um, important question, but it deserves more time. And uh, we'll, maybe the three of us could talk at some point. I think, uh, I know I would enjoy that a great deal. Judge Wynn, what an honor to have you here uh, with us today. You have such a, an interesting life and uh, you have so much ahead of you and you're doing so much Good work. Uh, I think we can all tell what a wonderful judge you are and what an honor it would be to appear uh, before you. Um, thank you for your wonderful service to the country and to the courts. Uh, thank you students for being with us here today. And uh, I see Sarah Bell is also here. Thank you, Sarah, uh, for also helping us pull, pull this together. So, uh, Enjoy your, your time at Duke, and uh, I look forward to meeting you in person. Let it, I, may it be soon, may it be soon. <laughs> yeah. I hope we'll get a chance to spend some time together in person as well. I've really enjoyed our conversation today, and thank you. Thank you so much, bye-bye.